Hi, welcome to Red Blend evening. And um, we're gonna get started. I'm just starting to open my wines as people join us. That's interesting. All right. Hi, Mar. Hi, Liz. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I always try to have at least one bottle that I open so those of you who struggle with waiters corkscrews can get a picture of how you do it. Take the knife, slice it open. Welcome, Mary. Hello. Hi, Mike. Welcome. All right, a friend of mine sent me the picture of a sommelier who was, um, hi, Lori, uh, welcome, who was um, opening a bottle of wine so much more elegantly than I do. If I had to do it every day, I'd be better at it probably, but um, I'm not, I don't. So, so we get what we get, okay? The beautiful um, picture of the sommelier had his wine laying in a beautiful basket as he elegantly twisted the corkscrew and easily opened his bottle. It's not me, okay? <laughs> There's a difference between a, 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 single, a single and a double jointed corkscrew. And so this one is a double jointed. The single are much, much harder to use, okay? Sylvie. Oh, oh wait, okay. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Keith. Hi, Greer. And hi, Sylvie. Thanks for joining us, everyone. All right. If you want to go ahead and open your red blend, if you haven't yet, if you have a higher end red blend or something for Bo from Bordeaux, I would definitely open it um, before we started. But if you haven't and you are just opening it now, make sure when you pour it into your lovely giant glass, because as we know, red blends we are, are high-end red reds always go in a larger glass so that there's larger surface area. All right. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and pour mine just to get a little bit of aeration into it. So as usual, we have all these different tasting glasses to show you. These are all reds. They would be thinner, more narrow if they were white. All right, welcome, Christine. Hi. All right, I think people will be joining and we'll greet them as they come. Please remember that if you have a friend, there's a glitch with, with um, Apple. If you have people who join who I'm not direct friends with, I may not see them, but if you welcome them, just put a, a quick comment in welcome friend, whoever it is. Then after that, it appears that I can, um, that I can then see them and, and their comments, so. All right. Um, so welcome everyone, as I've already welcomed you. Um, we've, this is our fourth, our fourth key. Is that right? Fourth. Yeah. Yeah. We did Cabernet. We did uh, Pinot Noir and we did Chardonnay and now we're doing um, red blends. So we're doing like every red tonight. Um, so, and yes, <laughs> hi Tina. Welcome. And yes, Marla, thanks for asking. I am wearing pants today. <laughs> I could have sweatpants on, but uh, I don't. I did get dressed today. Um, so um, we've been using so we've been using wine to connect to one another during these difficult times. And <laughs> Keith is verifying that I am wearing pants. I hope everybody's hanging in there and keeping their social distance. Um, but Keith and I are really hoping through doing this, we can bring a little bit of light um, through this tough time. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. <laughs> and of course, uh, thank you to everybody who's on the front lines um, who may join up, join later, listening, listen to the recording. Um, everybody who's an essential employee, employee still working to um, fight this pandemic. So cheers to them. Cheers. And cheers to all of you joining us tonight. Oh, it's awful. No, I'm kidding. It's not. <laughs> all right. Keith, do you mind opening up this one as well? I can open one. Yeah, thank you. 
All right. So very quickly, for those of you who don't know me, who may be listening later on, um, I'm Allison Miller. I am owner of Artisan Wine Group, and we create connections through unpretentious wine exploration. So feel free to ask any questions that you have, um, to comment anything you want. And sometimes I may ignore you if it's obnoxious, uh, but <laughs> I enjoy the obnoxious comments. And sometimes I miss comments, just so you know, I look back after and I've seen comments I missed. Keith is going to try to um, help me catch those, but, um, but if he doesn't, feel free to then go ahead and, um, you know, re-comment, okay? Um, and, um, all right, so we are going to jump into what do you need tonight? As you know, you need a bottle of red blend. Um, open it up. Make sure you have a few glasses. And as we talked about, bigger glasses so that we can oxygenate. If yours was a pretty high quality wine, swirl it a little more. Okay, we try to oxygenate it. The, the wines that are not as high quality may be much more fruit forward, not as much to them. They can over oxygenate. You can still swirl them, but I have used um, aerators with some that almost made them flat, where right out of the, bo the bottle, they had more acid or more to them than that. All right. Um, what can you expect tonight? We'll go through similar tasting. Um, <laughs> hi, Tracy. Welcome. Um, we'll go through a tasting all together. Red blends are um, a little, it's, it's, it's um, what's the word? It is a big undertaking to teach a class in red wine unless we're tasting together five or six wines. So there's lots of information because as you know, red blends are different from all over the world. So it's like we're covering every red varietal tonight. So we're gonna do the best we can. Um, certainly stop me and ask any questions that you may have. And um, feel free to drink your wine as we are tasting. When you do a wine tasting with me in person, oftentimes I'll, hold, I'll, have, I'll serve one wine, but I'll ask people to wait until we are tasting together for the next one. This one, just go to it. Just have fun and drink and enjoy. All right, um, and I, I plug this every every week just because I want to make Dana. sure if anybody joins. What's that? Dana. Oh, I didn't see Dana join. Oh, there he goes. Hi, Dana. It's my brother. Welcome. Um, we're drinking red blend, so grab whatever you have and grab a glass. Um, difference between tasting and drinking. So when we're just drinking it all together, hanging out, you might taste some of the fruit, but you're not really thinking about it. You're not really engaging your brain. And the cool thing about tasting wine, of course, I love wine tasting, but you're engaging all of your senses and your memories, and it's using a lot of your brain. And in fact, there was a recent article, I'm sure there's an article on everything, but, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm giggling. Christine said, I like the sign on the wall behind you. Where'd and that was, a, that was a, a gift from Christine um, that says, this wine is made awesome. So thank you, Christine. And hi, Gail, welcome. So um, as I was just mentioning, the tasting of wine, it's building your, you're using your brain, your guilt, you're using all, there was a, just an article that was talking about how great wine tasting is for your brain. Okay. All right. So, um, and then you figure out what you get from it as we enjoy the social interaction together. I do feel like I have you guys in my living room. Um, the more you comment. Hi, Pam. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. And, um, and so wine tasting together, it's a great way to slow down, but it's also a, a really good way to learn what you like, what you don't like, and what your personal profile is. Time and again, I've sat down with friends to have a glass of wine. And as we, you know, I might taste it and say, um, <laughs> I may taste it and say, oh, I don't like this, where another friend may not admit it. Or they may say, I don't, I really like this one. And because everybody has different brains, different memories, and different taste buds, we're all going to experience the wine a little differently. And so when you do a wine tasting in a, um, like if you go to a tasting room and you're tasting their wine, oftentimes they're suggesting to you what you're tasting. And certainly because wine is subjective, you can pick those things up. And so we practice... Um, we practice kind of commonality and, and figuring out words that other that wine professionals will, will use as well. Hi, Stu, and hi, Anne. Welcome. All right. So we're going to jump into these red blends that we're tasting. Tonight, I'm Pam tasting, Keith and I, screen. what's on here? Pamela shared the screen. Oh, Pam is 
Oh, yes, Pamela Joy. Oh, Pam, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Keith says hi if you didn't hear him, Pam. Um, <laughs> all right, so this one that we're tasting, and everybody's going to have something different, we'll, and we'll address that. Tonight we have, I picked a South African um, Cape Fusion, simply because my company will be selling it ultimately um, in the next few weeks, but this is a nice blend out of um, South Africa. Okay, but the other one that I'm even more excited about sharing with you is the Con Creek. It's called the Keith's Love 15th Anniversary Wine. And that's because I created this wine at a blending class that Keith and I attended when we went to Napa for our 15th anniversary. And so this one is another great one. It's a little too cold because it just came out of the fridge, but um, it's another great one that we will try and we'll talk about. Okay, so, or this one as well. All right, so how are red blends made? Basically what, what winemakers do when they're creating a red blend is they create a barrel of a varietal. Varietal is a specific grape. So they might have certain barrels that are Cabernet Sauvignon, certain barrels that are Petit Verdot, certain barrels that are Merlot. And they go through and taste each one as after the fermentation, after they get the juice to where they want it to be. And they'll, they'll likely, depending on the taste quality, set it aside to make a red blend. Some winemakers are known for their varietals, like they are a big Napa, big cab houses, right? They wanna make a really good Cabernet Sauvignon, but they might always also put in a blend, a red blend. Maybe they have some odds and ends, things the winemaker wanted to try, the grower wanted to try. Other places, like in Italy, Sasakaya, um, Antonori, they thrive on red blends. They make hundreds of dollars of big red blends. And when they grow their varietals and create their barrels, they are creating it in order to build out their blend with that vision in their minds. Because remember, winemakers are artists. And so um, that they are putting it together after they grow it, blending it together, picking and trying and, and trying to figure out percentages. Okay, so I've done a bunch of blending classes because I like to go to a region and taste that region. So Keith and I did, when we went to Con Creek, we got to try from, I think it was like six or seven of their um, vineyards. And so we really got a taste of what some of the riddles taste like in that specific vineyard. And then after that, we're given the task to put these elements together and you can pick and you can choose what you wanna put in there. I will tell you that after trying all those wines, I had no idea what I liked. It was so much and I just kind of guessed until I thought I liked one. Inevitably, what Keith and I have found out is I like his blends. <laughs> I like the ones that he puts together. So, um, so anyway, um, so what are the red blends? So you have yours in front of you. Their red blends are treated just like reds. They are to be served at 60 to 62 degrees. Okay, so if yours is cold and just came out of the fridge like my other one, you have a, a glass with a stem because it's easier to swirl, but you can warm it up with your hands. If you have a stemless glass, that's, that's what it's best for. You can easily warm it up, okay? If it's cold, does anybody know why you want your red wine to be warm, served warm and not cold? Not hot. Keith doesn't know. <laughs> I'm waiting because so. I say so. Right, right. I will definitely dictate the temperatures of his wine. Okay. Um, <laughs> I like Pam what said she likes, likes what he likes. <laughs> so, um, so absolutely, if it's cold, you don't get the same full taste qualities. With red wine, there's so many taste qualities that come out of it that, as food in general is colder, you experience it differently. And this is it's made to. Um, have lots of, um, of taste qualities. And also Marla said so it can breathe. Yeah, absolutely. Because if it's warmer, it's oxygenating more completely. It interacts with the oxygen, with the air um, in, a, in a different way, in a better way. Yep, very good. Yeah. Hi, Sahal. Welcome. And hi, Carolyn, if you're with Sahal. Um, and happy birthday. Um, we're just jumping in and tasting red wines. We're talking about uh, red blends and serving 60 to 62 degrees. Okay, so now if you want to take a look, if you have something white, a white piece of paper, it doesn't matter what it is, but you can go ahead and hold your wine glass up to the white paper 
or white, whatever it is. It can be a white wall, it doesn't matter. And what you're looking for is you're looking to see if you can see through the wine. That's gonna tell you, first of all, the color will, might give you an indication of what kind of wine it is, but also it's gonna tell you if there are any faults. And so if you see sediment, if you see um, something floating in there, that could be normal or it could be a fault. So if you're served at a restaurant and you're served a, a wine where you have things floating, yeah, they should be, um, it could be a piece of cork, but they should be so, um, so finding that. So when is it normal and when is it a fault? Okay, good question. So <laughs> if it's sediment, like something dark, tannin, settling, um, sediment from, from um, sediment from um, the, the wine that you're drinking settled on the, on the bottom, and um, that's normal. But if I were to open it at home, I would definitely pour it and, um, and then just pour carefully at the end of the bottle. But in a restaurant, especially a fine wine restaurant, they should be able to filter it out and they should see it. They should be able to see it as they're pouring. And there's a whole technique that sommeliers are supposed to use with um, a, a candle and a flame to examine the wine and just to see if there are any faults before they serve it to you. If the so, wine blows up, it's bad. Um, what's that? If the wine, yes. So, so how um, that Italian Brunello sounds, I love Brunello, it's fantastic. Um, so cheers to you. And, um, <laughs> and um, Lisa, if something's floating, yeah, that's a fault. There should be nothing floating. Okay, so we always go through the um, sea, swirl, smell, and sip. And the sea is mostly to tell the viscosity, gives you an idea of how the mouthfeel is going to be, in um, how the wine will feel when you drink it. And then um, also we're looking at the color and how, how, how much you can see through it. Okay, so all of that is going to tell you a little bit about the wine itself. All right, yes. Um, and welcome, Carolyn. So um, this is, I want to try to do this. So, so because red blends are such a, so normally we do one varietal. Welcome, Oliver, our dog. Um, normally we do one varietal, but because we're doing red blends tonight, there are going to be so many, we're all going to be experiencing something different. Okay, red blends are huge. They're a, all over the world, um, made all over the world, and they share characteristics of the certain regions where they're made. And they can be for porch sipping, they can be for hanging out at the pool, they can be for barbecue, a big, big red blend for barbecue, or um, they can be for a specific meal. If you're choosing them for a meal, you have to look at, hi Chrissy, welcome, um, you have to look at um, what your particular characteristics are. And so you're going to be looking at the region for red blends. Okay. So this is a little different than what we normally do, but we're going to give it a try. Okay. Um, with all the, all the regions. All right. So after we look at it, we're going to swirl it. And I set mine down on the table to swirl it, but the stem makes it much easier to swirl. And then we're going to smell it. And we're going for the, Which the one? Um, I'm doing the, um, the Asara. Yeah. The Cape, the Cape fusion. Yeah. Okay. Mary asks what restaurants in our area actually have sommeliers. I was at Eddie V's in Burlington. Uh, Keith says he was at Eddie V's in Burlington. Were you with the sommelier there or were yeah, you? That's, oh, you didn't catch the, no, the, the, the conversation was I, I didn't know how to order, so I asked. Oh, I see. Okay, so Tuscan <laughs> Kitchen, it, it's interesting. They have Joe, who's their wine expert. He's awesome, and anybody who's ever been able to take a class with him, you um, would would absolutely enjoy it. They do. He does a beautiful wine tasting dinner um, downstairs in their cellar. They also have their bartenders, and they get Italian wine certifications. So they're not necessarily sommeliers, because sommelier is a function of your job. Um, so Tuscan Kitchen may have one in their other um, restaurants, but it, they don't have one. Joe would be their sommelier in um, in in Salem. Okay. Joe the owner? Not Joe Farrow. Joe the other guy. Joe Comforti. Yeah. yeah, who used to live in Wendell. Okay, so we're smelling and we're thinking about predominant characteristics. Okay, now here's the trick with red blends. All the other nights we've been able to pull out what we're smelling and what we are tasting. And it's been similar because we were doing the same, there's a basic varietal, um, there are basic varietal terms and characteristics. Tonight, because we're tasting different things, we're gonna get different things. So for example, example, Sahal and Carolyn have a Brunello. So that's gonna have a different smell taste quality because that varietal um, is different than say 
um, a GSM, a Grenache Syrah Mouvedre, or a Bordeaux, which is um, Cabernet, Merlot, and one of a few other grapes that might be added into it, okay? So what I'd like to challenge you to do is take your smell, take your aroma, and see if you can identify the taste qualities in it or the smell qualities in it, okay? And just kind of make note of those. And then what I want you to do is do the taste part kind of on your own. So remember when we taste wine, we do an initial sip and then we do a second. And then we think about what are we experiencing? A good general rule of thumb is to think about the fruit first and then what else comes on top of that, what comes after it. Okay. You're also thinking about is your wine balanced? Is there more acid? Is, are there more tannins? Are there more fruit? Or are they equally balanced? And some people will like a more tannic wine, depending on your um, palate. And some people will like a softer, smoother wine. And some people like a perfect balance. Okay, so that's all learning about your taste profile. Okay, so while you are tasting your different wines, I'm going to um, just share with you some of the things that um, if we, if um, in doing a red blend tasting that we would pay attention to. Okay, so um, you may, so the first, the first taste quality I get, is it a black fruit? Is it a red fruit? So is it red cherry? Is it red berry? Is it raspberry? Is it strawberry? Or is it a black fruit? Is it black raspberry? Is it um, black plum? Okay, um, and those of you who have my card game, you can kind of page through it and see if you're finding any of these qualities, okay? So is it earthy? Are you tasting earth? Is it stewed fruit? Not to be um, mixed with stew. Hi, Michelle, welcome. Oh. Are you the black plum that we mentioned? Oh. Oh. Okay, fig, you can find fig in there. Black cherries. All right, so you're trying to pick out these different qualities. And I'm gonna give you a hint. If you can figure out what you're tasting, we can compare it to where your wine is from. And so if you have a Bordeaux blend, you're gonna be tasting really Cab Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, and Petit Verdot um, taste qualities, okay? So go ahead and someone, or any, you guys can put up, put up what you, what taste qualities you are experiencing. And we'll see if we can match them to the variety. Does Liz always say earth? Earth, Liz got earth. <laughs> <laughs> Keith wants to know if that's your old standby. Okay, so as, as a wine professional, if you, so Sahal, great. Okay, so, so as a wine professional, normally if we were to do a blind tasting, what the rules are always you have to bring a varietal okay so once you get into blends then you're kind of picking and choosing and that's what we're trying to do is figure out what taste qualities so for example when liz says earth and it depends on the kind of earth but potting soil um, i may go to a cabernet something really earthy um maybe um an italian an a sangiovese sahal has berries so the net that's a great comment so what kind of berries are they dark berries or are they red berries? So blackberries are red berries because different wines will have red or black. And my guess is the haul for you, it probably is red berries. Now, how, how do you know? How do you know what they are? So what you wanna do is stop and think about when you're eating a red raspberry versus a black raspberry, what is that experience like? We're all- um, You're not gonna tell Mary to put black raspberries into her? No, wine. we are not gonna mix our black raspberries in wine today. We did that <laughs> last week to confuse some people. But um, <laughs> certainly um, red berries and blackberries taste a little different. So see if you can pick out the difference. Marla has um, smells, um, she gets the salt and the sea. And that's interesting. So uh, likely there's a coast, a sea coast near where it's created. And get some cheese. What does that tell us? These are all clues, right? Um, that tells us that the, this is, it's oaky, all right? Um, Gail gets earthy with hints of cherries and blackberries. Yeah, so that could be a Merlot, that could be a Cab. Um, and gets black cherry and plum. So black cherry um, could be Mer Merlot, and again, Cab, okay? And so we're move, as we're moving down, and I look at all these comments, because it's a blend, you're going to 
definitely have lots of different tastes. Um, we have some black pepper. What? Karen Davis. Oh, welcome, Karen Davis. <laughs> um, Keith showed me um, the comment because I can't see all of them. So, um, so yes, Liz, please don't mix any earth into, into your glass. So what Liz is referring to is last week I had people pour just a little bit of wine into a side glass and put some different things into it to give you an idea of what they what these smell qualities and um, taste qualities are in wine. Because you can say I smell pepper, but until you taste how it interacts with wine or smell how it interacts with wine, sometimes it's hard for people to pick up unless you do this a lot. Okay. Um, all right. Career to be. Um, is going to the, the food um, aspect. She's looking for some brie, okay? All right. And so these are great. Everybody is picking up these wonderful um, different taste qualities. Welcome, Jenna. Um, and, um, and so as we're going through this, people are calling out their taste qualities. Now, we're gonna step, step and go each one. Okay, so check your bottle. Make sure you see where it's from. And if you don't know, you can put it up. All right, and here's these are the major blends. Bordeaux blends. Bordeaux blends from the left bank versus the right bank are different, but in general, if you have a red Bordeaux blend from the left bank, it's going to be predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon, and then some Merlot, and then you can also have in it Cabernet Franc, Malbec, or Petit Verdot. Okay, and just to demonstrate um, the um, just to demonstrate the complexity of tasting red blends together, if you are drinking um, a left bank Cabernet, um, Bordeaux, the Cabernet Franc is going to give it the red dark fruits and the dark plums, and then the um, the Merlot is going to give it some some cherry, okay, and some other attribute, and then the Petit Verdot. Let's say they use Petit Verdot it's gonna give you a tannic taste. It almost makes your mouth go like that. I don't know if that's, if that's <laughs> too visual for you, but that's how, it, that's how it feels when you taste Petit Bordeaux. So they all add in their unique mixture, okay? So Bordeaux would be predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon, and then um, it's gonna be those, the blend of the other varietals. On the right bank of Bordeaux, it's gonna be primi pr uh, primarily Merlot. On the right bank of Bordeaux, it will be predominantly Merlot. Can I say that 10 times fast? And then all of those other pieces in it. Okay, so that's the, a classic Bordeaux blend. So you're gonna get, you might get cassis, you might get blackberry, you might get dark cherry, you might get vanilla, because they're all oaked. You might get um, coffee bean, you might get spice and licorice. Oftentimes Bordeaux are powerful, firm, tannic, big, okay? Um, and again, they're gonna be a little softer from the right bank, all right? So that's a Bordeaux. Now, some of you might be saying, well, mine's California. You haven't talked about that yet. Yes, and lots of you are drinking our country. Most, most of U.S. blends, red blends, are going to be some form of Bordeaux blend, okay? So Washington Bordeaux blend tastes different than a California Bordeaux blend, tastes different than a Napa Bordeaux blend versus a Central not, Coast not, because it's based on the fruit. Most is Bordeaux and not, not Cab? Like Cab, Cab and Merlot are the ones I like. Yeah, those are the big ones, and you like those. So, so what's the what are you like? Opus One, right? Opus One, yeah, yeah. And so, yes, and so you can get this big, beautiful Cab and Merlot fruit and mix those together, and they're fantastic. Um, Josh is making great a great one, um, and most of the U.S. ones are more accessible than the Bordeaux in terms of they're not as tannic. They can be complex, meaning they have lots of different taste qualities, but they're not as tannic or as earthy as Bordeaux itself. Now, what is a Bordeaux blend in the United States called? It's not called a Bordeaux blend. It's called Meritage, pron pr pronounced like heritage, Meritage. Um, I had a Bordeaux blend, a Meritage, in the Finger Lakes, and that was Cabernet Franc, because they don't have a lot of reds, a Cabernet Franc blend. So the general idea is your blend is going to be driven by where it's from, where it's grown, okay? So, um, okay, so, so Pam and Sahal brought out the big guns, the Barolo and the, and the Brunello, um, both fantastic, incredible food wines from Italy. 
Um, Marla's drinking a Bordeaux from um, Chateau Cantaloupe, um, and it's in the Cote de Bly on the other side of the Gironde from the Medoc. So it's on the right bank, but it's considered part of, or from what I could tell, it was considered part of the, um, of the Medoc. It's not the finer wine region of Bordeaux. So it's, it's a little bit more, it's, it's thin and lighter than a big heavy Bordeaux. Um, but she got, she has one that is a 2015. So the key to buying wine in Bordeaux in two, uh, is that two, 2015 was a phenomenal year. 2017, not so much. 2015, fantastic. That's a whole nother lesson on how do you buy wine in France, and it depends by region, as Michelle and I discovered this summer. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mary asks, is anyone getting concerned that Keith is going to start breaking into my wine? He is. He's, he's got his. He's got his. Um, <laughs> Mandavi has some beautiful ones aged in rye, so that's going to add a complexity to it. Okay, so I've only covered Bordeaux. So we're moving around the world nice. here, okay, because a lot of you might have American wines, but they're... <laughs> they still might have different, be different kinds of red blends, okay? So, um, and not only that, but um, again, depending on the region, so if it's coming, if it's a Napa bl a red blend, it's gonna probably have more cab, right? Um, I had an amazing Napa um, Grenache Syrah Mouvedre, which is a GSM blend. I highly, highly, highly recommend them. They're beautiful. Um, Grenache Syrah. Mouvedre. And, um, and I'm just catching up on comments here. Um, everybody's starting to um, starting to, to, to do your pairing. So you can go ahead and while we're doing this, because there is a lot of information that I'm sharing tonight, um, please taste your taste whatever you have that you want to try with it and comment with what you're drinking and um, <laughs> what it goes with what you've tried that it goes with. Okay. Um, all right. So, and um, Karen's drinking a Portugal 2017 red blend. That sounds fantastic. And so what you want to do now is, so as we're talking about GSMs, that's from France. It's from the Southern Rhone. It's Grenache Syrah Mouvedre, but you can find a GSM all over the world. Okay. Um, and you're going to get different notes. You're going to get smoke, bacon, herbs. That's from the Syrah, white and black pepper from the Syrah. Uh, from the Grenache, you're going to get um, orange rinds and ruby red grapefruit um, and maybe some oregano and maybe some tobacco. And then from the Mouvedra, you're going to get dark fruit, flowers, black, black pepper, thyme. Um, now, Lisa Gilbert is asking, what is Cinso? Okay, so that's another blend. That's another varietal. And I want to say that's from Spain at... Um, yeah, that one. So Cinso, I don't run into that often, but it is often used in a red blend. So those three are Grenache, Syrah, and Mouvedre. Okay. Um, but Cinso can be used in a lot of things. I also want to call out to you guys to further complicate it. If you are drinking a straight Cabernet Sauvignon out of California, let's say, it's still a blend. It's not considered a red blend. But if it's got 75% of that varietal in it, you can label it as that and you never have to call out the other parts of it. So if, if you're drinking a Napa Cab, it can be 75% Cab, still have a little Merlot to soften it out and some Petit, petit Verdot um, to, to give it a little bit of a different mouthfeel um, or to make it more complex and it's still considered a Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay, thank you, Sylvie. Um, and I haven't had a lot of, oh, yes, I have. Lori Bailey calls out the Portuguese blend. Um, and we did share one um, that was quite fruit driven, fruit forward. Um, but of course, you can get different complexities. So we've got the GSM, the Grenache Syrah Mouvedre out of France, but it's made all over the world. We've got the Bordeaux blends, which really people make all over the world and strive to um, because they're so good. And um, then we also have um, different subregions, which, which are known for different blends. So like in France, Chateauneuf de Pop, that's going to be more of a Grenache-based um, wine, but then they blend other things in, okay? So, um, so moving on, then there's Spain. And then um, in Spain, most of their blends, so Tempranillo is huge there, okay? A Rioja is made with Tempranillo. That's another grape. It's a varietal. 
they may add in gar um, garnacha, which is grenache, but they say it differently, carignan or carignania, um, and graciano. And that, a tempranillo, will have berry, tobacco, leather, vanilla, and herb. Does anybody have a tempranillo, um, a, a, a blend from Spain? Okay, so that one's gonna have red fruit, uh, raspberry, spice, cinnamon, maybe umami. Umami is, if you t it's, a, it's, d it's debatable in the wine world whether or not it really exists, but if you take mm. mushrooms and you cook them and you taste umami. that taste, Keith <laughs> believes in umami. Um, <laughs> and so um, umami is a, it's, it's a yummy food taste that tends to go really well with a good wine. Um, and I get Sahal and Carolyn um, that your Italian uh, Brunello would be great with some umami. Um, okay. Thank you, Pam, um, for the cab. And feel free to ask questions. I'm, I have so much information um, that I will try and answer anything you have. Marla got into the food pairing. Um, and so I, one note on the food pairing. They say to eat, to drink what you eat. So basically, <laughs> that just doesn't sound good. Um, the, a basic rule for food and wine pairing is what grows together goes together. Okay, so if you are um, having a white wine from the coast of Spain, you want to eat shellfish with it because they what grows together goes together. They're grown in limestone, there are shells in the ground. All the wines are picking that up, okay? So general um, rule of wine tasting. And so uh, Marla mentioned, so she's got the Bordeaux, if you remember, from Bordeaux, um, and she's tried different cheeses, salamis, blueberries, and grapes didn't do what weren't great. Um, just made it taste acidic. And a lot of that is because they're blocking your taste buds. And so then the acid kind of rises to the forefront. It could be that the blueberries and grapes, they have their own acid. So mixing together will elevate the acid. Um, the Kalamata olives increase the acidity. So her pizza will likely go is my guess. Okay, and lucky they're in Connecticut, they get peppies for dinner. Okay, and Pam says just drink, so let's drink. All right, so there's also um, the Priorat in Spain, and they're doing, again, the same, those Meritage blends, the um, Bordeaux, the blends with Cab. So they're taking Tempranillo, but they're also doing Cab Rallo, Syrah, and um, their, their wines actually are a great buy from the Priorat um, because they're outstanding red blends. So, um, and, and they're usually $12, $15. Okay. So Greer asks, what's the difference between red blend, blends of France and those of California? So again, it goes back to the region, and that's a great question. So a red, a red blend from Bordeaux, from the left bank, is going to taste different than the right bank. And part of that is because of the soil, part of that is because of the climate, and the winemakers and the expectations. And in France, they have very, very specific rules of what they can grow and what they can do. So a Bordeaux is just a red blend. However, if you are in, so in France, you have the Rhone. The Rhone is growing Syrah. So that's, France is difficult because you have to know what region corresponds with what varietal. But um, the Northern Rhone is what's coming out with the GSM. And so the difference between the red blends of France and those of California are that the red blend, France, all their wine is really made to go with food and it's made to be complex and it's made to be an experience. And they, France is really the seat of classic wine and wine tasting because they're the ones who came up with the concept of let's sit and enjoy our food and our wine and let's sit down to dinner and make it an experience between the two. And so all French wines, are made to be more complex and tell you more about what you're drinking. In California, it depends on the maker. So Central Coast tends to be warmer and they get juicier, um, they get more sun, so their grapes have more, um, more uh, juice and more fruit forward. Not all, this is in general in the region. And then in California, um, in, in like Napa or Anderson Valley, they have their own each have their own regions that um, have interesting things about them. More complex, Cab grows really well there. It's, it's, um, it's um, the, the soil and the um, region and the climate. Um, and Lisa Gilbert says the French have mastered their priorities. 
<laughs> yes, uh, yes. Um, French wine is fantastic. Now, Italian wine, similar thing. It's all about, because it's Europe, right? It's all about the food and the wine. Um, Americans came to wine being a little bit more simplistic and just enjoying and drinking and, and that was fine. But that's why we were not recognized until the 1970s um, for having fine, fine wine until we entered some really good wine from California into a French wine competition blind and we, um, our, our wine, California wine won, um, Chateau Montalina. So that's a, a great documentary. Bottle shot. All right, so we've gotten to the prior art. So now Italy. Okay, so super Tuscans, that's their big blend. And so they're out of Tuscany. It's a Bordeaux blend, basically Sasakaya, which is a few hundred dollars a bottle. Um, and then Antonori, they decided they didn't like that everything was being regulated by the government and that everything had to have Sangiovese in it. So those of you who drink Chianti, who like Chianti, you are drinking the Sangiovese grape. It tends to be very earthy. They have to be very careful with how they grow it because it's very vigorous. So. Um, Sangiovese picks up a lot of water and it can be these big, robust, just cherry grapes and they don't make great wine. So they have to make them struggle. They have to make the vines really struggle so that um, the grapes are more concentrated and um, have more um, complexity to them. And so um, these folks decided, hey, I don't, in the, this, is, this is just in the 1990s. We don't wanna, um, we don't wanna adhere to the rules of the Italian government we are going to do um, a blend. And so they started putting together these just unbelievable blends, Cabernet Franc and Sangiovese. Um, they're in incredible, but they are, they do tend to be expensive. But if you have a chance, um, I know Tuscan Kitchen has um, Ornelia, or it's probably pronounced a little differently, Ornelia. Um, and that's a beautiful red blend. And there's gotta be Cabernet Franc in there, a Franc, because there's beautiful dark fruits in there. Um, and also Joe Farrell created his own red blend, um, a, super, a super Tuscan with, with a winemaker in um, Italy, in Tuscany. So kind of interesting. All right. So any other wine region can be any blend. And so the rule of thumb is what are they known for? So Argentina, they are going to um, go with Malbec, right? Malbec is their wine, is their predominant grape that they do fantastic with. So they will do a Bordeaux blend, but put in Malbec. Okay. Ornelia is, it's incredible. I love it. Um, and so Greer tasted her red blend and it didn't taste good 42 minutes ago. Now that it has a chance to breathe, it's fantastic. Yes. So that's interesting. It's been in the bottle. I don't know how long it is. It has been in the bottle, but you can imagine when you are making wine, you, it's, it's getting air through the oak and then you put it into the bottle and then it ages. It sits and ages for a year, two years, three years. And so, um, with these wines, they're developing and they are growing inside. Wine is a, a live organism. And so um, if you can give them a chance to aerate, then it can open them up. Now, if it's a less expensive wine or a less complex wine, opening it up, it could, could cause it to fall apart, right? Um, if you let, excuse me, let it sit for an hour or two, but better wines, which Josh is, you know, it's, um, it's around the ice range so it could go either way and it could depend on the vintage um but it tends to be a good regular wine and so it's interesting to see it, it did breathe. and what you'll notice is what you tasted at the beginning may taste different and now that you mentioned that greer when you go back to taste it now see if any additional uh, qualities have opened up okay right so lisa Gr just had a lot of wine and now it tastes better. <laughs> Lori says, what vintage? Hers is getting better with time as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so now Marla had pizza with her Bordeaux and she's getting a lot of fruit. Okay, so that pizza cuts glycerol. through the acid. Yes, our wine tastes like acid, I mean like uh, Lysol, he said, because everything's Lysol here. Um, okay. And then <laughs> Greer told Marla to make sure you wipe each piece with a sanitizing wipe before you eat, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, a little bit of break from the stress, everyone, then enjoying our wine. Okay, so we now are trying two different kinds of wines, as I mentioned, okay? So one is South African. This is not it. One is South African, it's called Cape Fusion, all right? And this one is a blend 
of um, several different grapes. It's Shiraz, Pinot Tau, which is a blend of Merlot and another. Not um, like Merlot. Actually, that's not true. I can't remember the blend of the Pinot Tages. Um, Pinot Noir and something with a Taj at the end. Um, and then Malbec Petit Verdot. Okay, so this one is made in Stellenbosch in South Africa. And Sahal and, and Carolyn, I know you guys were there and I was there many years ago. Stellenbosch is absolutely beautiful and making incredible wines. There's not as many wine making rules in that area in terms of what you can blend. So they make some really, really, really nice blends. So when I'm drinking this, I'm gonna be picking up raspberry, dark berry, some mocha, um, definitely juicy red berries, and a little bit of chocolate if I really think about it. Okay, so that's the one that we just, um, the South African. And by the way, I didn't mention we do double taste, right? You do two tastes when you're really tasting because your taste buds can get overwhelmed or shocked when you first are tasting wine. So you do a, a second taste. And that shows that you know you're, what you're doing, wine is big. Okay, <laughs> Pam said Keith drank it all. Um, and now, Mar so Greer <laughs> is getting black cherry. So this is, this is a perfect study of wine, wine pairing. Okay, so I've said this each week, but I'm going to say it again because it's important. When you're trying to figure out what you're doing with food and wine pairing, when you eat food, food tastes great. You know, whatever you're making, depending on what you're eating. And when you drink wine, wine can taste nice as well. But when they're a true pairing, they elevate each other. They don't block each other. So that balanced wine that you had over here, if you don't have the right pairing, it's not going to taste good. It's not, it, it will interfere with it. If you have the right pairing, your wine tastes better and your food tastes better. If you've ever had the privilege of going to um, Chef David Bruce in Boston, he does wine dinners and they're unbelievable. And what he says is that he um, takes a sip of wine, um, or he'll, he'll taste each wine. He corvins it, he takes a glass, he, he tries it, and then he thinks about it. And he thinks about what he's tasting. And then he picks the food that he thinks it will go with, and he makes it beforehand and tries them together. And as Greer said, because Greer's a fantastic cook, hi, Jim, uh, Jill, welcome. Um, as Greer said, she, she adds, often will add the wine into the recipe, and that helps augment it. And so Sahal mentions that Stellenbosch is super underrated. It is, it's a beautiful region in South Africa. And there's actually, there's a winemaker out of Boston, um, a female winemaker, and she has come up with um, this botanical um, wine um, vertical. And so she brings that and does a lot of tastings and her wines are, are fantastic. I'll, I'll, I have some of them here, um, but there are some really, really nice blends. So, um, so that's that one. And then this one, this is a, um, so we're talking about food pairings. So this one was really, really fruit driven. I would probably do like a light chicken with this. It's led with Syrah. Syrah should have, this one, it's, it's not quite as, as peppery as I like a Syrah to be. Um, and that's probably the Pinotage kind of mellows it out. So this is like a really good drinking. If I was um, at the pool or what are they, por porch sipping. This is a great porch sipping wine. This Cape Fusion, not super complex, very, very cool. Lamb, actually, yeah, that's interesting. Lamb would be great with kind of a mid-level um, Bordeaux blend or Meritage, okay? But something like a, um, an earthy, deep Italian, the lamb sauce would need to go to be a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. Lamb sounds good, <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and the Bolognese sauce, I mean, that, again, going back to the Italian, that the Italian with the earth um, and the acidity would go together nicely. Um, and it seems like nobody has a GSM. Um, and if you guys don't mind commenting again on what you have and what you're tasting with it and what you're finding um, in terms of food, that would be great because it went by pretty quickly. The other one that Keith and I are tasting is this Bordeaux blend, or this blend, Meritage, that I made from the blending class at Concrete in Napa. And um, I don't remember the blend, but it was, they pretty much gave us Cab Malbec. Did they give us Petit Verdot? Um, I don't remember. We have our, did we? I'm sure we have our notes somewhere, but um, let's sure try, don't. let's see if we can taste <laughs> the Cab. I can definitely smell the oak. I can smell the vanilla. I can smell the toast. Oh, 
Okay, this is fantastic. I love it much more than the other one. Um, I definitely getting it's cab, but there's a lot of Merlot in it. And the Petit Verdot, I can feel at the end, it's just a little, and it slowly unveils itself as you taste it on your palate. So first fruit, then those secondary qualities, the oak, the um, toast, and then at the end, I'm still tasting it, it has a long finish. In the end, I can feel that grip. That's the Petit Verdot. Okay. <laughs> Liz is drinking Keith's Love <laughs> from Napa. I finally got Pam's joke. Um, yeah, okay, all right. Um, so Lisa Gilbert, so Marla is still with the Bordeaux and with the pizza. She's got mushrooms, I think, on her pizza, and I think that's what's augmenting it. Lisa Gilbert, yours is light and smooth. That's because it's a Grenache Syrah, um, Mouvedra, and the Cinso um, from the Cote d'Aron. So that is a Southern GSM, the Grenache Syrah, Mouvedra. And there are actually, that's a really great um, price point as well on that one. Yeah. Um, and then, um, let's see. Lori Bailey has the the Josh and Lori, what, what can you call out from that? Okay, Lisa, thank you for the name. If anybody's looking for yeah, a really good thank GSM, thank you to the Baileys for the toilet paper. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you to the Baileys for their toilet paper drop off. Um, <laughs> all right. Does anybody else want to share? What they are what they are tasting. All right. So as we're going through this and we're looking at, and again, you can see this one's challenging to talk together. Hi, Kristen. Welcome. Join, join us. Grab a glass. Um, you can see this one's a little bit more challenging because there are so many varietals. So we're not really, we're tasting together, but we're not experiencing similar things like we did in the last ones. And so it's more of a juggling. And so it may have, may have seemed to you a little disjointed. So please feel free to ask. But really what we're calling out here is that we're looking at different factors that affect how our wine smells and tastes to figure out what regions you like, what are the qualities that you like. And of course, in all of my wine studies, I had to memorize all the varietals and all of the regions. You guys don't need to do that. You really just need to figure out what are the best flavor pieces that, that you like that match your, your flavor profile. Now, some of you, you're not really sure what words to use. So someone, I did a private tasting the other day and someone said to me, I feel like I'm tasting um, when I went into my grandmother's kitchen and she had this specific spice. Now, that's perfect. That is perfect in picking out what you're tasting. You're using your memories to think of different experiences you've had. And of course, wine is always better, by the way, it, having good experiences, right? A wine tastes de definitely better with good friends. The wine I was drinking when they were beating me. <laughs> right, and that experience is not great wine. Um, <laughs> But, um, but using visualization like that, trying to figure out, okay, what is it? My grandmother's kitchen, what was there? And so we talked about, well, that might be cloves, right? Cloves have a certain smell to them, um, spices. And so, and then she said, oh yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, and we had a similar experience last week when Gail was tasting and she said, I taste something sweet and I'm not sure what. But when we were looking at the varietal, one of the things that you can experience is canned peaches. <laughs> Boy, and man. that was perfect. That was a perfect <laughs> match. Uh, Manischewitz is just fruit and sugar. It's, <laughs> so if you like it, but it, it is, it's a lot of sugar. Okay, definitely not, definitely not a fine wine. So when you're a winemaker and you're going to make a red blend, what, what are you thinking of? What are you thinking about? So you're thinking about, okay, what is, what is the region I'm in? What are we known for? What am I growing well? What do I want? What do I think can sell? And it depends on the wine maker, right? So if it's somebody who's just making small batches, they want to make a lot of money and they want it to stand out, okay? And so they're gonna go for something different than um, someone who um, is like a Robert Mondavi who's looking for a base level for people to just enjoy or a Josh, right? They're trying to hit a lot of different palettes of people that wanna try lots of different things. When, and this is, goes back to what Greer was talking about as well. Um, what, what, why is this different? Or why is Europe different? Each region is trying to um, be, be true to their region. So they're, tr they're trying to come up with specific qualities for what are matched 
characteristic qualities that they're um, each of their regions represent. And that's why it's tough with, with red blends to all taste together. But um, winemakers are trying to figure out, okay, what's true to my region? What do I want to represent? And um, how do I make it stand out? And particularly for European um, wine merchants, wine makers who have to sell to merchants, it depends where they're selling. So they're going to make a wine, if they're focusing on China, for example, they're going to make a wine that is different than they would make for the U.S. or different for um, wine that we, they would make for, if you're in France, for the French or for the Italians, um, if you're in Italy. Um, and England is getting on board, too, and making some interesting wine, you know, like sparklers, interesting um, sparkling wines that they are trying to, to, to market. Um, so winemakers are going to think about that. They're going to think about whether or not they want to oak or unoak. Um, most red wines go through malolactic fermentation, which is a secondary fermentation. So the first time they ferment, that's to turn the sugar into alcohol. And the second they're going for um, it's a softening, they'll introduce um, lactic acid or lactic bacteria, and that causes a secondary fermentation. And that adds complexity and character and stabilizes the wines. So that's another thing that they're thinking about. So I have this huge list of all of these wines that go into red blends and what each of their taste qualities is that you could be picking out. But I think you guys kind of get, it's the fruit first, depending on what the predominant blend is, right? The fruit that you're tasting first, then the secondary would be from the, the oak and other things that they've done to the wine. And then there are tertiary um, characteristics that come in as well, depending on how it's aged. So if, if a bottle of wine has a cork in it, it's actually going to age differently because the cork is, depending on where the cork is, is grown, it's going to, it's going to interact with the wine as well. It's a living, or, you know, it's, a, it's an organism as well. Well, the wine interacts with it. Um, and also oxygen can get through. That's why you lay wine down because if it has a cork, you need to keep the cork wet. Otherwise it will dry out and more air can get into the bottle and impact it. Screw top, not so much. And why you should always check your cork to make sure it's wet. Why you should always check your cork. That's sure, right, that Pete, was wet, by the way. To make sure that it's wet. Very good. Very uh -huh. good. Uh -huh. Okay. So in terms of um, storing wines, how do you store wines? Storing red wines, always 55 degrees, um, 10 degrees below the ideal t serving temperature. Okay. What happens if you um, store your wines too warm? We found that out a few years ago when our wine refrigerator died and all of the wines went bad. What happened? It speeds up the aging process. So they taste stewed when they go, no when they're warm. Stew. It's better, no offense to, it's, <laughs> it's better to keep your wines cool than it is colder rather than warmer. You don't want to freeze them, but um, the wines 75 uh, Fahrenheit and above can be, um, they become cooked and they become mushy. Yeah. Okay. Do they over, um, too? Like, the no, that's a good question. No. Can they hear my questions? Yeah, I think they can hear you. Okay. Yeah. That's All right. Perfect. All right. So this this concludes our lesson on um, red blends. If you enjoyed the Cabernet Sauvignon class more or the Merlot or the specific varietals, please make sure you answer the survey so I know what you want to taste. Cabernet um, Red Blends won this week, but I'm thinking Malbec or Cabernet Franc, uh, Franc may win for next week or Merlot. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Marla is writing in her um, her food preferences as well. The garlic interfered. Pepperoni add, and mushrooms. Can add um, acid, and uh, the red pepper pizza was better. Yeah, yeah, and that's par partially from the cheese. Uh, all right, and remember that salt makes everything better. So if you taste something and it doesn't taste good with the wine, add a little salt. That will make it uh, pair a little bit better. As always, to um, email me with any questions or messages. So thanks so much. Take care and uh, stay safe, everyone.